never ceases to amaze me. Whenever our youth take part in service, never ceases to put a smile on the face of our Heavenly Father, brother. Church, would you give the Lord a round of applause for the time? serving the Lord in, in this capacity and then I start running through my head my boys I know where Sullivan is I know where Davis is I haven't seen Braxton since church started Tiffany where's Braxton oh, she looks at me and she says I don't know where's Braxton oh, no. I said you don't have him she said no don't you I said no and then both of us turn and see Caden in the back and I said I know where Braxton is he's in the back sitting next to Caden and Marcy said thank y'all for watching my boy with the <laughs> small heart attack all is well all is well this evening, I want to talk about a topic that is both a blessing and a challenge at the same time. A topic that for Christians is our lifeline, and yet sometimes our greatest struggle. The story goes that there was a young boy who lived in the country, and his family didn't have running water in the house, and so there was the outhouse that was on the back side of the property. And anytime anybody needed to use the restroom, that's where they went. Those of us who grew up in the country can relate. Anybody did not have running water when they were coming up? Awesome. So you can relate. What's awesome about this story, though, is this little boy had got to this place where he said, I'm tired of this outhouse. In the summer when I go out there, it is hot. It smells terrible. When we're in winter, it is cold. And if I am sleeping and I wake up and this is just something i got to do, i got to trace through the snow to get out of here and do what I need to do. I'm tired of it. I'm not doing it anymore. And with that, he proceeded to push the outhouse into the creek behind the house. Mm -hmm. A little bit later, as they're having supper as a family, the dad looks at the young boy and he says, Son, uh, something happened today. And I, I'm wondering if you might know something about it. And he said, Well, what's that, Dad? And he said, Well, it seems, son, somebody pushed that outhouse into the creek, and I've just kind of got this feeling that it was you. So, Mom, before you serve his plate, if it's okay, we're just going to go on back to the woodshed and have a conversation. Yeah. Little boys walking the whole day like this, right? Anybody yeah. ever been there? Yeah. Walk in, open that, won't get that part of the head in. And he says, the young boy to his dad, he says, Dad, do you remember the story of George Washington and how he chopped down the cherry tree? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, because George told the truth, his dad didn't punish him. Do you remember that story? He said, Yeah. <laughs> He said, the son, there's something about that story that's different than this story. He said, what's that? He said, George's daddy wasn't in the cherry tree when he chopped the cherry tree. <laughs> <laughs> the subject for tonight is one word, and that is forgiveness. Forgiveness. C.S. Lewis once said, everybody says that forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have somebody that they have to forgive. Then it's a whole new ballgame. You got your Bible with you. We're going to be in John chapter 8 tonight, looking at a beautiful example of how Christ forgives us even in the midst of some of our darkest times. A very familiar passage of Scripture, one that has proven to be the benchmark for many of us and caused us to consider our attitudes towards others. And so to set the context for us, uh, Jesus has been preaching in the temple complex in Jerusalem and he's causing some frustration amongst the Pharisees. You know, he did that from time to time. These religious elite uh, didn't believe him to be deity, but instead they saw him as trouble, they saw him as a blasphemer, and so they devised this plan to trap him in his words. And so John chapter 8, beginning in verse 2, and I will ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word, starting in verse 2, reading through to verse 11. At dawn, he went to the temple complex again, that is Jesus, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked him this in order to trap him. They had evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. 
And when they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and he said this, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again, continued riding on the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men, and only he was left with the woman in the center. And when Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Then neither do I condemn you, said Christ. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Bow your heads with us. Father, tonight as we dive into your word, as we look at a familiar passage of scripture, Lord, the prayer is that you would give us fresh eyes to see, fresh ears to hear. Lord, that through this passage that you might speak clearly to us tonight on a topic that we all need to hear from time to time, and that is forgiveness. Father, certainly as we were singing earlier tonight, everyone needs forgiveness. And Lord, we thank you for sending your only Son, Christ Jesus, to die on the cross in order that we might have forgiveness of the sins in our lives. Father, may that be what's in our minds and in our hearts as we dive into this word. Lord, I pray that the words that I share would not come from me, but that they would come from you. And Lord, may you receive the honor and glory for all that will continue to take place in this, your house. And it is in Christ's name that all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Receive it, please. Forgiveness often becomes necessary when difficult situations are handled poorly. Can I get an amen on that? When difficult situations are handled poorly. So first of all, the question is this. How should we approach a difficult situation? These Pharisees and the scribes were considered the religious elite. They were the ones who knew it all. They had been studying from early on in life. They were the ones that when questions came up, they were the ones that offered the answers. <clears throat> These guys were the top of the top. There was nobody else as far as they were concerned as to who knew what was going on. They knew Scripture inside and out. They knew the law and followed it to the letter. They also knew that the best way to prove Jesus was trouble was to attempt to trap him in his words. This man's deity, so he says. He's been healing people. He's been ministering to people. Let's find out exactly what he's going to say whenever we throw the law of Moses out. Let's prove him to be a liar and thus rid ourselves of him. Then they bring this lady in, an adulterous woman, and they remind him as if he needed to be reminded what the law had to say. You ever had a situation in life when somebody came to you and there was an accusation? And you said, you know, now, this is what we've done in the past. This is how it should be done. But what say you? That's a difficult spot to be in. I'm going to spin that just a second. As the new kid on the block in southwest Indiana, as the new kid on the block in the church, there have been times when some of y'all have come to me and said, this is how we've done things in the past. How do we need to handle it? That's a difficult situation to be in. Because in your mind, you're thinking, I want to handle this the right way it needs to be done. I'm keeping in mind the way it's been done up to this point. But at the same time, you're looking to me for direction. So how do we need to proceed? Jesus didn't have that problem. Because it didn't matter how things were done up to that point. In his mind, at that point, he was the one who knew all that was in Amen. his control. Correct? With me so far? Correct. Keep this in mind as we're moving forward. Difficult situations. How much controversy could we afford, <coughs> could we avoid, rather, if we would simply just stop and think before we spoke? Notice Jesus didn't immediately give them an answer. If they say to him, what is it we should do? This is what the law of Moses says, in case you don't remember. This is what the law of Moses said. What do you say? What should we do? And he goes down and begins to write. He begins to write and begins to think. I wonder tonight how many of us could avoid hurting others if we would simply take a minute before we responded with the first thing that came to mind. Ever been in one of those moments? Perhaps you were hot to trot, you were irritated, you were upset, you were aggravated, you were flat out angry, mad, and mean. And in the heat of the moment, you just chose to say the first thing that came to mind because you saw the person and it was time to just boom. I've been there. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I have. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. And the first thing that comes in your mind is, let me tell you what you can do with yourself, your opinion, and all that has to do with you for a minute. Neither one of those are okay things to do. Just want to go ahead and clarify real quick in case you're wondering. But I wonder sometimes if we simply would pause. Husbands, 
They irritate us. It's life. It's just the way it goes. And ladies, you can say the same thing. I know. But guys, because I'm going to talk to y'all, because I am one, I is one, and somebody would say, we could avoid a lot of controversy if you just think before we spoke. Okay? Just going ahead and get that out there. Then. Ladies, y'all can say it again if you want to. I, this is your opportunity. I'm giving you the platform right now. I'm looking at your husbands, and I'm telling them, think before you speak. Ladies, if you want to, throw an amen. This is your only chance. Go for it. Amen. All right, good. We're moving forward. These men come to Jesus, and he knows what they're trying to do, but instead of playing their game, he pauses, and then he responds. You know, Paul said something about that. He said, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Each individual that comes to you needs to be handled as an individual with respect. They may be coming to you with a legitimate complaint, or they may be coming to you with garbage, but whatever the case, they're an individual that deserves our respect. Amen. Christ died for all, not just you, but them too. And so in those moments, keep that in mind. Solomon put it a different way. Proverbs 15, the soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up what? Anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Jesus shows us in the midst of a very difficult situation that we ought to pause, that we ought to breathe, and think before we respond. But from Christ's example with this young lady, I've got three questions that I want to walk through. Number one, who do we forgive? The woman who was standing before Jesus was in fact a sinner. She had been caught in the act of adultery and had been brought before him for sentencing. And according to the Mosaic law, the Jewish law of the day, she was to be stoned to death. My dad, in his church office, for probably the first 15 years of my life that I can remember, had a little stone that he kept on his desk that said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And it was a small rock. And in my mind, that's always what I envisioned whenever this passage came up. But help me. Let me help us all, rather, to understand exactly what we're talking about. When you're considering stoning someone to death, it was not a small pebble that you were just going to sit there and continually throw at this person. We're talking about large rocks that were thrown to kill the subject. This was what was prescribed, and they knew it, and they wanted to see what Jesus was going to say whenever they threw it up in his face. In the eyes of the law, her sin was up there right with murder. And after handling the Pharisees, what is it that Jesus said? Go and sin what? No more. The words used indicate that Christ would not hold the sin against her if she simply would turn from it. Think about that for just a second. Isn't that what he offers us? In our minds, in our American minds, our 21st century minds, whatever societal norm you want to put in play, in our head, in our line of thinking, we have a hierarchy of sin. Many of us would like to think that the white lie that we told to the person as we were walking through the grocery store was nowhere near what takes place in some of the worst penitentiaries and some of the darkest of alleys across this nation, across this globe. But in the eyes of a holy, righteous, and just God, there is no hierarchy of sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of whose glory? God's. For all. Each and every. It's a little bit different when you throw that word all out and you consider all. Okay, there's a lump sum. But if you were to use that word for each have sinned, then it gets a little bit more personal. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us in need of forgiveness. Somebody might say, you don't know what I've done. How is it that Jesus can forgive me? Maybe we found forgiveness and we're thinking to ourselves, how is it that he could have done that? How is it that this translates to our day-to-day -day lives? Hear me. Who is it that we should be willing to forgive? All of them. Each and every. It's real easy to say, I forgive that group of people. But when we take time to give that group of people the dignity that they deserve and look at each one of them in the eye and realize, I'm forgiving you, I'm forgiving you, I'm forgiving you, then it's a little more personal, then it's a little deeper. He extends forgiveness. Lord, I love the sound of that coo and baby. I love it, I love it, I love it. Mama, if you let him keep making noise, don't even worry about it. 
famous Methodist preacher Charles Allen wrote about a time in his life when as a fourth grader he had been mistreated by a school principal. His father and mother had moved him out of the school district. Years went by and he found out that that same principal was moving into the school district in which his church was located. Determined to exact his revenge for his mistreatment, he straightened his collar, got into his vehicle to go to the school's district, excuse me, district office to explain to the superintendent the type of man that he was considering hiring. Keep that in mind. Now, we're talking about a Methodist preacher who, as a fourth grader, which puts on teachers, I'm guessing, 11-ish, 10, 11, he's still holding that grudge, right? I'm going to go see a superintendent and let him know exactly what I think about the guy he's thinking about hiring. Here's the rest of the story. Alan made it two blocks from his church when he was overcome with emotion, and here's what he had to say, quote, Here I was trying to represent him who was nailed to the cross by straightening my clerical collar while I was carrying a grudge against someone 25 years earlier. That realization was a humiliating experience. Went back to my house, knelt by my bedside, and said, Please, Lord, forgive me for my unwillingness to forgive. You say, Marshall, you don't know my life, and you don't know what so-and-so did or said about me. And you're right. I don't. But what I do know is that, but for the grace of God, so do I. Amen. All of us sin daily. All of us are in need of forgiveness. A forgiveness that is offered to us in the person and body and blood of Jesus Christ. So who is it that we're to forgive? Everybody. Second question, why? Sometimes the best way to approach a question is to answer another question. So maybe I should ask it this way. Why don't we forgive? Why do we hesitate to forgive? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? I can't believe he would do that to me. There's no way in this world I would ever take the time to forgive him. Making it all about me and less about him. Barriers to forgiveness often include those very things. Yet, Jesus destroyed the barriers to forgiveness when he willingly chose to die on the cross at the hand of sinners. Amen? Right. He died on the cross in order that we would have forgiveness. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul wrote this. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Right. To put it briefly, why do we forgive? We forgive because he was willing to forgive us. If you don't hear me say anything else, hear this. To choose not to forgive someone is to elevate yourself to a higher place than Almighty God. I don't want to go down that road. John 1. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all what? Unrighteousness. Notice the if-then statement. If we will confess our sins, then He will forgive us. The forgiveness is not automatic. It takes an action on our part. We have to recognize that we are sinners in need of the Savior. Can I get an amen that I'm not the only one in this room? All of us are sinners in need of a Savior. And by golly, what a good one we've got. You say, Marshall, what if that terrible person doesn't come to me and ask for that forgiveness? I'm not comparing the two. I'm not saying Jesus versus you, hear me. What happens if in that moment that you're beginning to think through and think, I need to forgive person A, person B, person C? If that person doesn't come to me personally to ask for that forgiveness, do we have the responsibility to forgive them anyway? Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. We absolutely do. And if for any reason we think we don't, it would be appropriate for you to check your attitude. Mm -hmm. Because we are not without sin. What was it Jesus told the Pharisees? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then what they do? One by one, starting with the oldest, they walked away. <coughs> encouragement tonight. Not beaten down, and encouragement for the night. Before you get so wrapped up in your feelings and in your arrogance and your pride that you think that person is beneath you, remind yourself that Jesus died for them too. Not one of us is on any higher playing field than another one. All of us are safe by grace. Why do we forgive? Because He forgave us. Last thought for the night. How 
do we do it? Sometimes it's easier than others, amen? amen? It's a whole lot easier to forgive the guy that cut us off in traffic than it is to forget some, forgive somebody who caused harm to our family. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? Marcus Baker would tell you that's really pushing it because he doesn't do well with people who cut him off in traffic. I learned that in Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> I got something out of it. When Jesus was in the temple complex with the Lord before him, her future still seemed uncertain. Can you imagine being her in that moment? We're looking at Jesus, but put yourself in her shoes for just a second. You're wrong, and you know you're wrong. And you know what the letter of the law says is supposed to happen. And yet, this man has just challenged the ones who are sentencing you to death. They've since walked away, and now it's just you and him. I wonder what was running through her mind. Scripture doesn't say, but that's one of those questions right up there with why didn't Noah kill the mosquitoes that I'm going to ask. But I can't. It's all part of God's plan. In a show of mercy, he looks at her and he says, As no one can give you, neither then do I go and sin no more. Jesus knew she was a sinner. He knew. She'd been caught in the act. She knew, he knew exactly what was going on. But Here's the kicker. Faced in that moment with her plethora of folks seeking her death, Jesus challenged them with that very simple phrase. Let he who is without sin. That's the first one. If you want to wrap this sermon up in one sentence, it's simply this. Before you deny forgiveness, remember that Jesus died. I'm not telling you that forgiveness can happen overnight, amen? There are times we've got to think some things through, and I respect that, I get that. But at the end of the day, we should always fall on that one simple truth. Jesus died for him or her to all of the sinners in the of Savior. I'm going to take a pastoral privilege and do something that I've never asked our praise team to do, but I'm going to, I already got Drew's permission, so if anybody can play this, talk to him. Can I get all of our musicians back up on stage? Congregation, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as we transition. But we're about to sing a song that we did a few minutes ago, entitled I Will Rise. Congregation, consider this. We are surrounded by sinners on a daily basis. Forward with the attitude that we are perfect and without sin, then we are sadly mistaken, to put it mildly, arrogant and sinful to make it real. Who do we forgive? Everybody, because God was willing to forgive them. Why do we forgive? Because we have been forgiven. And then how is it that we are to forgive? Completely. How is that possible? When Jesus was hanging on the cross over 2,000 years ago, he looked out at the crowd that was mocking him and jeering him, and he cried out to the Father, forgive them. How was he able to do it? But that he saw us through a lens of love. There is sin in the world. And in one way or another, we are involved in it. Don't be so foolish as to think we're not. But as we prepare for this time of invitation, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes with me as we approach the throne of our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, tonight... There may be one here carrying a sense of guilt. As Brother Dave and I were talking in, our office, or in the office earlier today, Lord, we go through times where we need to be reminded that forgiveness, first and foremost, has to come through recognizing that we are sinners in need of saving. Lord, of all the forgiveness that I've ever sought, the one that seemed to be the most important, the one that, that is the most important, is making sure, Lord, that I am right with you. Father, we need to be reminded that when we mess up and when we cause others harm, we're not only sinning against them, Father, we're sinning against you. And Lord, in that moment, may we be reminded that your grace is sufficient, that your love is all encompassing. If we simply will admit it, and request forgiveness. Father, tonight, if there's one here this morning carrying a sense of guilt because they've never trusted in Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, they've never asked for the forgiveness that we're talking about, then, Father, as we sing, 
May your Holy Spirit convict. Poke hearts, Lord. If there's something that needs to be made right with you, Father, may tonight be the chance. May we take the opportunity. Whether we're seeking Christ's forgiveness, whether we are asking Him to be our Lord and Savior for the first time, or whether we're recognizing that we messed up maybe even on the way to church tonight, and we're just asking the Lord to forgive us. Father, if there's one here tonight looking for a church home, if this is where you have them to be, Lord, our prayers that you would lead them here, and that in these next few moments that they would come down front and talk about it. Father, if there's someplace else you're leading them, then Lord, our prayer is that you would just take them where they need to go, with our blessing and with our purpose tonight, as we stand and as we sing a familiar yet incredibly powerful song. May we consider the forgiveness that we've been forgiven, and thus the forgiveness that we should extend to others. Holy Spirit, flow freely. May we be obedient to follow. It's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Stand with me, please.